Hi guys, welcome or welcome back. Thank you so much for being here. It's so greatly appreciated. Let me give my usual disclaimer. Please do not take what I say as fact. Please always do your own research. Next, a huge thank you to my subscriber, Sandra Mendenhall, for recommending this case to me and for picking me to be the one to cover it. I truly appreciate it. And with that, let's get started. Kimberly Everett Cox was born on January 12, 1970, and resided in Mississippi. Her husband, David Cox, was a commercial truck driver up until he injured his back and went on disability and started to receive disability checks. Kim and David met in 2000 through a friend from work. After a small courtship, the pair married. At the time, Kim had two daughters. After Kim and David married, the pair would go on to have two sons together. In 2009, while staying with her grandparents, Kim's daughter, Lindsay, mustered up the courage to text her mother and tell her that her stepfather, David, had been essaying her for quite a few years while her mother was out of the house. She would go on to tell her mother that she had kept this secret for so long because David threatened to KILL them if she ever told anyone. Kim, who was understandably shocked and angered by this news, reported the claims to police and Cox was arrested and jailed shortly thereafter in North Mississippi. He was charged with statutory RAPE, SEX UAL battery, child ABUSE, and possession of METH. During his nine months in jail, Cox would often become enraged when talking about Kim and would express his hatred for her to his cellmates, blaming her for his incarceration and making it well known that upon his release, he was going to KILL her. David never ended up going to trial and would end up being released from jail in April of 2010. After his release, Kim got a restraining order and moved in with her sister, Christy Salmon, and her three children. May 14, 2010. David Cox purchased a 40 caliber handgun and two extra magazines. From there, he borrowed a van from his brother and drove over to Kim's sister's home where she and the kids were living. Once there, David shot his way into the home. Kim, Christy, Lindsay, and David's sons, DC and JC were all home at the time. JC and Christy were able to escape and call for help, but Kim, Lindsay, and DC would end up being held hostage in the home for eight hours. Cox did communicate with police throughout the night and the early morning. The first 911 call was made at 7.10 p.m. It was on that call that police would learn that Cox had SHOT Kim twice, once in the arm and once in the abdomen. The last confirmation that Kim was alive was at 12.45 a.m. on May 15th. While Kim lay dying, Cox would repeatedly SA her daughter, Lindsay, in front of her, knowing that there was nothing she could do about it. How awful, how terrible. That's heartbreaking. That, that, During the eight hour ordeal, Cox would communicate with hostage negotiators, Kim's father, Benny, and her stepmother, Melody, his brother and sister-in-law. At trial, Agent Chris Jones testified that Cox screamed into the phone that he was going to K-I-L-L Kim and Lindsay, and that if law enforcement attempted to enter the home, he would be going for head S-H-O-T-S, knowing that they would be wearing body armor. Officer Alan Shavers, a police officer and hostage negotiator, testified that Cox told him that he S-H-O-T Kim in the stomach. He encouraged Cox to release Kim for medical treatment, to which he responded that he wanted to watch Kim D.I.E. He went on to testify that Cox said to him, quote, since you're so interested in her, I want you to hear her beg before she dies, end quote. Shavers and Cox would have several conversations that evening where Shavers would continuously plead with Cox to release Kim for medical treatment. And each time Cox would reply that he wanted to watch her 
D-I-E. Chavers would speak to Kim that night also, where she would plead for her life. Cox told Chavers that if officers tried to enter the home, he would K-I-L-L the children. Cox would also speak to Kim's father, Benny, and stepmother, Melody, that night. They testified that Cox told them that his original plan had been to K-I-L-L Benny, Benny's other daughter, Christy, and Melody. He went on to tell Benny that he S-H-O-T her and that she was, quote, bleeding like a stuck pig. He then put Kim on the phone and her last words to her father were, Daddy, I'm dying. He would go on to speak to Melody multiple times after this, but refused to speak to Benny again. He told Melody, you effing B-I-T-C-H, I hate your guts, but I hate his worse. So this is the way it's going to be. You and me are going to do the talking. Melody would testify that Cox was taunting Kim while on the phone with her, saying things like, are you having fun yet, you B-I-T-C-H? Are you enjoying this? Is this fun, Kim? He would then go on to threaten to put a in Lindsay's head. Cox would also talk to his sister and brother-in-law that night, bragging to them that he, S-H-O-T, that B-I-T-C-H, and that he wanted her to die a slow and painful death. His brother-in-law, Michael, testified that he spoke to D.C., who told him that Daddy hurt Mommy. Going on to testify that Cox was yelling at Lindsay and threatening to S-H-O-O-T her, stating that he had told him that he had one for Lindsay and one for himself. He said that he heard Kim saying, quote, David, you know I'm dying, end quote, to which David responded, I know you are. After multiple failed attempts to get Cox to release Kim for medical care, the SWAT team finally entered the home at 3.23 a.m. and took Cox into custody. Lindsay and D.C. would be removed from the scene with no physical wounds. Kim would sadly be found dead after having bled out from the two wounds. Why it took them so long to enter the home and take Cox into custody remains a mystery to me. Maybe there was a reasoning behind it, but if there was, I don't know it or understand it. It seems to me, personally, that if they had entered the home sooner, Kim may have had a fighting chance. Not to mention that she was SHOT at 7.10 p.m. That's a long time to suffer. Why? Like, just why? What's the reasoning behind this? I need answers. David Cox pled guilty to capital kidnapping firing into an occupied dwelling, and three counts of set battery. On September 22nd, 2012, Cox was found guilty on eight counts and sentenced. Count one, capital murder, sentence death. Count two, kidnapping, sentence 30 years. Count three, kidnapping, sentence 30 years. Count four, burglary of dwelling, sentence 25 years. Count five, firing into a dwelling, sentence 10 years. Count six, sexual battery, sentence 30 years. Count seven, sexual battery, sentence 30 years. Count eight, sexual battery, sentence 30 years. Counts two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight are to run consecutively to one another. David Cox was scheduled to be put to death by lethal injection on November 17th, 2021. People are here outside the governor's mansion protesting the death penalty. This comes as the execution of David Cox is underway right now at the Parchman prison. This woman is holding a sign here that says murder one plus two doesn't equal justice or mercy. Cox was sentenced to death in 2010 for the of his wife. According to court records, Cox shot his wife in the stomach, then his stepdaughter in front of her dying mother. He is the first person executed in Mississippi since 2012. Now, there's not many protesters out here, but one of the ones we spoke to says the turnout, it doesn't matter. It's, it's important his voice be heard. Not speaking out is always worse than speaking out, even if you are the only one. I also know that there are lots of people who 
agree with uh, stopping the death penalty in states. So, well, I'm alone right now. I don't feel alone. Cox was sentenced to the death penalty in 2010, which leaves the question on why it took 11 years. We spoke to the state public defender who says the pending litigation over the used in executions is part of the reason the process has been slowed down. He also said the carefulness in courts used to evaluate these cases is another factor. Live outside the governor's mansion, Michaela Franklin, 16, WAPT. Right before his execution, David Cox told his attorney that he was the one responsible for the murder of his sister-in-law, Felicia Warren Cox, on January 2nd, 2007. Felicia disappeared after going to see her sister-in-law, Kim Cox, who was married to Felicia's brother, and she was never heard from again. After her disappearance, her 1999 Chevrolet Blazer was found abandoned on Waldo Road. The locked car contained Felicia's purse and medication, but no sign of Felicia anywhere. According to Felicia's daughter, David Cox told authorities that he would disclose where Felicia's remains were only if a judge signed off on a paper stating that his execution date would not change. David wanted to be executed and he felt as though he was worthy of an execution and he didn't want to delay it any longer. He waived his attorney-client privileges and disclosed where Felicia's remains could be found. His lawyer would bring forth the information two days after his execution, with David drawing a detailed map of where Felicia could be found. After nearly three hours of digging, they would find remains that would later be identified as belonging to Felicia Cox. The countdown is almost over. We are now less than an hour away from the first execution of a death row inmate here in Mississippi in nine years. WTBA's Tanya Carter continues our live coverage on the execution of David Neal Cox. She joins us live now from Parchment with the very latest. Alyssa, the state just gave its final media briefing before the execution of David Neal Cox, which will begin at 6 o'clock. MDOC Commissioner Burl Kane said that Cox ate his last meal, surrounded by three chaplains, as well as the deputy wardens, as well as himself. He said Cox is ready to go. He also said that Cox is very remorseful about the crimes he committed, particularly for his sons who are still here with us. Now, as you know, executions can bring out raw emotions on both sides of the argument. And happening right now, death penalty opponents are holding protest prayer vigils across the state as well as outside of Parchment. These three ladies are standing outside right now on the grounds of Parchment. They told me they oppose the death penalty and are not affiliated with any groups. Now there are other groups being led, there are other protests being led by two groups, Death Penalty Action Network, which is a national organization that wants to abolish the death penalty and Mississippi Rising Coalition, a grassroots organization based in South Mississippi. Both organizations, again, are holding this peaceful prayer protest in an effort to stop Cox's execution, though Governor Tate Reeves said yesterday he will not stand in the way, and all indications are the execution will go on without delay. I think one thing that moved this one along was he wanted the execution, so therefore that caused it to move a little faster. The other, the last one I did in Louisiana was the same situation. He wanted the execution. Other than that, it may not have ever happened. Who knows? Mm -hmm. And just a footnote to this story, Leah Campbell with Mississippi Rising Coalition issued a statement earlier this week saying that the deplorable conditions at Parchment is the reason why Cox wanted to be executed. And yesterday I actually spoke with one of Cox's attorneys with the Mississippi Post Capital Conviction office and she is unfamiliar with those claims. Now the execution process will begin at six o'clock. The commissioner said that David Neal Cox has already been moved to the chamber right next to where the execution will take place. Again, the execution process will begin at six o'clock. 
Cox was set to die at 6 p.m. when a series of three would be injected into his body, one by one, rendering him unconscious and relaxing his breathing until his heart stopped. Cox had spent the last nine years of his life on death row at the Mississippi State Penitentiary. Burl Kane, the 79-year-old commissioner of the Mississippi Department of Corrections, held his first of three press briefings at exactly 2 p.m. Kane described a calm and upbeat Cox who had been guzzling Mountain Dew in the days leading up to his execution. He had been transferred to Unit 17 the previous Sunday. The unit that was used solely for executions in an island unto itself in the fields of the sprawling prison complex and can only be accessed by a single road. It is surrounded by a perfect rectangle of tall fencing topped with spiral barbed wire and guard towers erected at each angle. Due to a lack of air conditioning, the temperatures on death row can become stifling in the summer and inmates are often forced to strip down to their boxers in order to cope. Those on death row live in their cells, described as the size of a parking spot, nearly 24 hours a day. This is where they will eat, sleep, and use the bathroom. They will live like this for the remainder of their life. David Cox lived like this for six years. 4.45 p.m. David Cox had an hour and 15 minutes left to live. By now, he had consumed his last meal of fried catfish, coleslaw, hush puppies, and banana pudding. As his execution drifted closer, he had begun expressing remorse for his crimes, saying, At one time, I was a good man. The seeds of the bad man may have begun taking root as early as childhood, when Cox was consistently exposed to P-O-R-N, and when he witnessed his father are worrying his sister. They may have begun to grow still when David stayed home from school and huffed gasoline and when he eventually became addicted to meth. 5 p.m. David Cox had one hour left to live and it was at this time that those selected to be witnesses to the execution began to trek to Unit 17. After crossing metal detectors and being patted down, the five media witnesses were handed a pen and a notepad. They were then made to wait in a large empty room until the van came to take them to the death chamber. The ride was short and not much was said on the way. Soon they were on a dirt road at the end being Unit 17. At the gate, Everyone inside the van got out in order to be searched for the second time. It was now 5.44 p.m. and there was a growing sense, foolish or not, that they may very well miss the execution. Sixteen people squeezed into the room, some having to stand. Everyone focused their eyes on the window. The front row of three chairs were occupied by two women and a man who would later be revealed to be associated with the Mississippi Office of Capitol Post Conviction. Cox had been a client of theirs before waiving his appeals. He had, however, requested his attorneys witness his execution. There was to be no talking in the witness room. The only sound heard was the steady wave of breathing in and out. Then a watch's beep beep pierced the silence then another beep beep. It was now 6 p.m. David Cox had seconds left to live. The curtain on the other side of the window slowly started drifting upward. Before them lay Cox, crucifixion style, on a gurney. His arms stretched at his side with tubes entering both wrists. His six foot two body tethered to the gurney by thick leather straps. His red jumpsuit was mostly hidden under a large white sheet coming up to his chest. He had grown a large beard, the color a mixture of black, white, and gray. The hair on his head was unkept. Cox was asked if he had any final words. He did. Cox said that he wanted his children to know that he loved them. 
He was a good man at one time. Don't read anything but the King James Bible. Lastly, he wanted to thank Burl Kane for being so kind to him. And that was all he had to say. Medazalam would be the first injected into David Cox. He would be unconscious within 30 seconds. The next drug would induce a state of paralysis and cause the diaphragm to fail. Then a final drug would be injected into Cox, potassium chloride, which would stop his heart. The only movement he exhibited throughout this process was a few seconds of slight twitching in his throat and lips. Besides this, he was perfectly still. Soon, Sunflower County Coroner stepped towards the gurney and put a stethoscope to Cox's still body. It was 6.12 p.m. and he was dead. The execution was complete. A man inside the chamber proclaimed, and with that, the curtain window began to descend. It was 6.36 p.m. and Burl Kane was giving his last press briefing for the night. To him, the execution of David Cox was the smoothest that he had ever witnessed. He made a point to address the lives that Cox had shattered in his wake, the life of Kim Cox he had so cruelly stolen. The events of March 14, 2010 that initiated this execution on November 17, 2021. Another person that made their way out of the quiet Mississippi Delta that night was Lindsay Kirk, the stepdaughter of David Cox, whom he had tormented for all those years. Kirk, who witnessed the death of her mother, had now also bore witness to the execution of her stepfather. She confessed that she wanted Cox to sit on death row for the remainder of his life. The sons of David were still processing what had transpired that day, with one of them admitting to their grandmother that he feared that their father would return to harm him, to which his grandmother told him, a dead person can't hurt anybody. Breaking news tonight, Mississippi's first execution in nine years is now complete. David Neal Cox declared dead at 6.12 p.m. Courtney Ann Jackson with a recap of the day's events from Parchman, including reaction from the people who saw him die. David Neal Cox had been on death row since 2012. In the hours leading up to the execution, a handful of protesters gathered. I couldn't stay home when the state of Mississippi is executing somebody. Wish we'd wake up and quit doing it. It's violent and it's, you know, there's all this ceremonial stuff, you know, where you can park, what you can do. Um, and we're killing somebody. He's gonna be dead. The commissioner spent time with David Neal Cox on a few different occasions ahead of the execution. And despite having a lack of regret in filings to the court since 2018. He talked about closure to the, to the victim and particularly to his sons because of, you know, taking their mom and so forth. So he has been remorseful. His last meal. We had, we ate with him and we had catfish and we had coleslaw and hush puppies and we had a banana pudding. French fries. Everything happened on schedule. We spoke with some of the media witnesses when they returned to get an idea of what happened in that room. And he had a white sheet up to here and he had on a, um, a red jumpsuit. He had a beard and his hair was kind of unkempt and he said the last words. Those words were, I want my children to know that I love them very much and I was a good man at one time and don't ever read anything but the King James Bible. And I want to thank the commissioner for being so kind to me. And that's all I got to say. Cox um, appeared to sort of move his mouth a little bit, maybe, like his lips were working like that. And then his breathing appeared to be labored based on how his chest and throat were moving for just a couple of minutes after the um, I assume were administered. Cox was declared dead by the Sunflower County Coroner at 6.12 p.m. Okay, guys, if you're still here, thank you, thank you, thank you. I appreciate you so, so, so very much. This was a tough one, but an important one. So if you stuck around, I appreciate you. And I thank you more than you know. Please like, subscribe, and comment if you haven't yet. It would mean so much to me. It would help me out so much. Especially because it's, I put so much work into these videos.
please leave me your thoughts and comments below. And until next time, guys, take care of yourselves.